things I didn't know. You may have heard about how ice cores were being used to measure carbon dioxide or how tree ring data is used similarly. You may have thought, gosh, that's a lot of data and a super complicated process. And how's it even going to help me figure out today's carbon dioxide and whether modern technological processes are causing it? Determining this, well, we'd need a baseline of carbon dioxide before all this technological wonderpalooza started in the last century or thereabouts. You can see from the ice core data points above, scientists have been able to determine that carbon dioxide amounts have mostly stuck on the high end at around 280 parts per million in the air. This isn't the only way scientists test for this, and the various forms of measurement help to give scientists a high degree of confidence in the accuracy of these measurements. Okay, so we can get a baseline this way, but it looks like the amount is just going up, and that still doesn't explain how technological processes are pushing this along or how we even know. I just found this out, actually, and I think it's rather fascinating. The Scripps Institution of Oceanography has been directly measuring the air in Mauna Loa, Hawaii since 1958. Today, multiple sites have been started all over the world doing the same thing, and they confirm one undeniable trend. CO2 in the atmosphere is going up. And when they test the CO2 for carbon-14, carbon-13, and carbon-12 ratios, which are all isotopes of carbon, to get a kind of carbon fingerprint on where it came from, they're finding an increase in carbon-12's ratio. Why is that important? Carbon-14 is mostly found only in young organic matter because it's radioactive. The amount of carbon-14 lowers over time as it radiates out. Carbon-13 is heavier than carbon-12 and so isn't as easily absorbed by plants, and we mostly find it in the emissions from things like volcanic eruptions. Fossil fuels, on the other hand, they're made up of really old, dead things, where all the carbon-14 has radiated out. It's long since been gone. And when it gets burned up by power plants, cars, and other technological processes, we'd expect to see the carbon-12 to tick up because we're releasing that old, buried carbon-12 from fossil fuels into the air. And like I said, that's exactly what we're seeing. On top of that, the increase of CO2 overall has been so dramatic that the 280 parts per million that we saw up until you know the 1800s is now not even visible in our rearview mirror. All right, you say there's more carbon in the air. Why should I care? What's in it for me? Well, for starter, there's a technology to pull CO2 out of the air and make fuel from it. Yes, that's right. It's technology that's available now. Multiple projects out of MIT and other places in the world are looking at converting carbon dioxide into various forms of fuel at a commercial scale now that they've done some initial tests and proven they can do it. This is like mining for gold, but you don't even have to go looking for it. The first country to do this well will get a great head start on fueling from the clouds. When people don't believe the indications that science is showing and these sorts of projects don't get funded, we lose out. And though scientists may disagree on the exact impacts of carbon dioxide in the air, there are plenty of things known and agreed upon more generally. Carbon dioxide levels are up significantly compared to any time in human history. In fact, they're at their highest levels ever. Carbon dioxide works as a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases affect global temperatures. And when you use data models that have been proven accurate by testing against past elevations in temperature, we know that in the future, temperatures are going to continue to rise overall for global temp. The good news is that when we do lower emissions, even for a period of time like the pandemic, air quality improves surprisingly quickly, which isn't to say other global effects go away as quick, but you can at least breathe some fresh air in the meantime. And for me, I love the idea of reducing air pollution. As someone born with bad lungs, 
by the time those air quality alerts happen, I'm already feeling sick. And I love the outdoors, hiking, staying fit, but I have to just put it all to the side when those alerts pop up. You can do some stuff on your own to reduce your use of carbon, but the biggest impact you can have is voting for cleaner air in the United States. If other countries keep polluting we vote and we vote correctly, we can turn their emissions into our fuel while cleaning up the air. It's a win-win. Win. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.